Hi, welcome to Teardown Tuesday. No, I'm not going to tear down a blue rubber ESD mat. I'm going to tear down a Nintendo 64, which I have been reliably told has been sitting in my mailbag for quite some time. So let's go up here to the mailbag shelf and have a look, shall we? I think it's going to be this puppy down here. Oh, lost a couple down the back of the bench. Oh, hang on. Got to retrieve them. And here it is. I guess you could uh, call this a combined mailbag slash teardown. It is from Dave Cheney from Ashfield. Thank you very much, Dave. Don't need my knife for this. It's got one of these convenient rip-off things. And I hope I got the right package. Otherwise, we're just doing a mailbag. Yep, here it is. Ta-da! A Nintendo... 64 beauty aha oh, check out that retro goodness mmm hi Dave I've really enjoyed your teardown Tuesday segments especially ones that focus on older gear someone was throwing out this N64 unit and I thought it would make an interesting subject for a teardown I'm sure it will thank you very much Dave he's from Sydney as well and ta -da, Nintendo 64 Dave has uh, told me on Twitter that um, it doesn't work so uh, what's what's this in here this is the, I mean that's the cartridge slot I don't know I've never used a Nintendo uh, 64 never had one um, I don't know what that is at all sure all you uh, gamer aficionados are uh, screaming at me right about now I know what that is it's probably even written on the front there we go memory expansion <laughs> and it looks like it's missing its AC adapter as well and that's a uh, rather neat look at that they've got a big uh, recess in there which plugs in it is uh 3.3 volts at uh, 2.7 amps and 12 volts at uh, 0.88 amps for ages eight and up it's lucky lucky i'm older than eight although the wife tells me i'm about four years old but there you go multi out little custom connector down in there and uh we've got ourselves look at custom slot i believe this was the last of the slot based uh, video games, at least from Nintendo anyway. After this, they moved to uh, CDs. And if you want to know some of the facts and figures on the N64, it is Nintendo's uh, fifth gaming console and uh, released in 1996. Whoa. Discontinued in 2003. So it had a uh, six-year uh, lifespan or thereabouts, although I'm sure uh, right at the end of its uh, lifespan it wasn't uh, popular. That's why they uh, discontinued it, of course. And they've sold... Over th almost 33 million of these little puppies worldwide. Absolutely incredible. And on the bottom side here under a slot we have an expansion connector. It almost looks like it's perfectly in line with the one on the top and the same type. So uh, I wonder if they're uh, wired in parallel or not. I guess we'll find out when, the crack, when we crack the thing open. Unfortunately, I don't like the look of the screws in this thing. And check out that evil piece of work right there. Some bastard manager at Nintendo decided, we don't want people getting into these. We'll put a security screw on there. Look at that. It's almost like a like a um, inside-out uh, Torx or uh, something like that. It's got little uh, uh, grooves around the edges like that. I mean, it's not too hard to make a tool to get into that. I mean, you could, uh, you know, hack a uh, flathead or something to go in either side of that I guess but uh, yeah what a what a pain in the ass along with all the custom connectors and everything on this thing I went hey let's put in we don't want any bastard playing with this thing let's use a security screw bastards and I've got a bit like this which might in well in theory could uh, fit but I think it's a bit too fat on the end there so don't like my chances and it turns out I can actually get in there with a pair of pliers and little needle nose pliers and turn that around. It's going to take a while. <laughs> ah, bugger it. Screw this. Mm. Well, it turns out that there are only uh, two bastard screws on that thing that I had to uh, drill out. So, didn't do any uh, lasting damage there. Not going to reuse uh, this thing, of course. It is non-working, but... Uh, that wouldn't, you can always tape it back together. Nothing you can't fix with a bit of tape. Anyhow, you can just sit it there like that. Not a problem. So let's lift the 
skirt on this thing and uh, see what's in today. A bit of dust. No dead cockroaches. No. Jeez, not much in here at all. And that's pretty much uh, what I expected. We've got to uh, take all this metal work off, of course. They've done all this. Um, it's a hell of a lot of uh, shielding on there. That's uh, really belt and braces stuff. I mean, whoa, unbelievable. But uh, yeah, very simplistic. I don't expect much on here except I um, under this, when we lift it up, I expect to see the... Uh, uh, main CPU, the uh, GPU uh, secondary processor, and really not much else. Maybe some glue logic and uh, other stuff. Um, uh, I don't even know if uh, there's going to be any uh, power supply because it was 3.3 volts directly in here, which uh, powers the main logic, I'm sure, just maybe through some uh, common mode chokes or something like that. But uh, yeah, I don't expect a, a huge amount in this thing at all. It'll be very, very simplistic. You watch. And, of course, it look, you know, it's super rugged, the build of this thing. You know, geez, you could practically run over this thing with a truck, and I don't think it's uh, uh, going to uh, cause an issue. So, yeah, let's pop all this metalwork off and have a look. Actually, I'm uh, going to guess that this top plate on here is um, acting as a heatsink effectively because I can't see any mechanical uh, purpose for it really if you have a look at the case that just sort of you know slots on there like that and there are these vent holes uh, there which are essentially just over that I mean there's no fan in this thing I'm not sure I've never used one I'm not sure how um, hot these things got but uh, yeah I mean there's a lot of screws on there so uh, like some, maybe um, there's some little heat sink uh, blocks inside which help get the uh, heat, spread the heat, uh, transfer the heat out to this external metal worker that's all passively cooled. Uh, and of course with this sort of uh, consumer product as well, they would have known very well, got some dust there, um, they would have known very well that uh, they were going to sell like uh, 10 million or so of these things or you know it would have they definitely would have known it would uh, sell in its millions even if it was a um, I guess a failure you could call it but uh, they you know when you start talking about that sort of volume you really design your uh, products with uh, manufacturing in mind DFM designed for manufacturing um, I'm not sure in what order these screws come off actually so I'll just take them all off I guess and uh, yeah so it's all about DFM designed for manufacturing so I mean all this uh, all this uh, metal work isn't uh, necessarily uh, cheap so you only do it if you have to um, but of course they you know had to to pass all the uh, EMC requirements and stuff but uh, yeah they've gone well let's uh, passively cool this thing and uh, not worry about a fan and all that sort of stuff and system integration of course as I said I expect to see the two main chips in here the main cpu and the graphics chip and uh that and pretty much the rest is just uh you know um just really cheapo stuff so uh they've would have put a lot of system engineering into this thing and we'll talk about the gpu in a minute but uh let's get all this off geez should have got my electric screwdriver out for this one now you can tell they're taking EMC uh, compliance very seriously by the way that they've gone to the trouble to manufacture in this bracket here, which uh, then just uh, that wipe on there just connects the shield of the socket in there to the main chassis down here. So we're, they're shielding that socket really, really, really well. They've gone to quite a bit of effort in there. Look, they've even put those uh, uh, key in. Um, studs in there, two screws to hold it down, there's an extra manufacturing step with the two screws and yeah, they've really decided that they have to do that because um, if they, you know, uh, you could have optimised this out, you know, if your, uh, your first units came off the manufacturing line or something like that and you notice that, that there's, um, well, even sort of a uh, pre-production uh, type run, uh, you might have done your basic EMC uh, tests on this thing with and without this bracket and well if you didn't need it well you know take it out but it obviously made it into the final production version so you know if you could you would shave a couple of cents off there and you'll notice the main connector down in there how there's uh what is it there's two four five pins which uh, stick up higher than all the others and they're, they're on both sides of course they would be a ground contacts designed to uh, mate first before all the other pins
And that just gives you a bit more consistency in terms of your uh, user hot swapping of these uh, modules. You know, it, it, you know that if you know that your ground contacts are going to connect first in your cartridge, then you've got a known condition to work on for your um, uh, hot swappable uh, hot plug design. And if this thing is a heatsink, and it certainly does uh, seem to serve no other purpose than uh, a heatsink, um, they really haven't uh, gilded the lily on this. They haven't really gone to town because it's not a multiple finned uh, heatsink like this, because it's all about the uh, surface area with uh, heatsinks. And, and, and uh, yeah, so they really, you know, that's just very basic uh, form. They've just you know, uh, just form that thing very simple instead of like a uh, a, a machined aluminium uh, block, which is much more expensive in production. So maybe some compromise there. Maybe uh, the design team said, "Oh, we need some more heat sinking," and you know, the uh, 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 bean counters are going, "Well, how much does that cost?" Or oh, I'd love to use a black anodized, you know, finned extruded aluminium heat sink, and they went, oh. Too much, cost too much. No, can we just go for a bit of uh, folded aluminium like that? Oh, yeah, kind of. It'll be okay, I guess. Let me run the numbers again. And, you know, uh, they come back and, well, that's what they've decided to go with. So, here we go. We're almost, almost there, I think. Oh, do I have to get those out as well, holding down the connector? I'm not sure. Oh. Yeah, that's probably it. We've got some really extra long screws in there, so that should now, hopefully, ta-da, lift out. And we'll get shielding on the bottom, of course, as well. But uh, all this should, hey, prise apart. There we go. A few passives on the bottom. Not a huge amount. I see a couple of uh, uh, transistors, or they're marked uh, D diodes. A couple of, uh, yeah, not much, but uh, just some general uh, bypassing and, uh, and lots of main uh, power traces here used it look we've got a nice low impedance path there with lots of vias around here and here so they're obviously getting that uh, power across there but uh, there we go let's um it looks like yeah we've got power here routed down to the mechanical uh, switch on the front so that is a good clunking, well, it's a cheap-ass sliding switch. I was going to say it's a good clunky mechanical switch. It's not. It's just a cheap-ass uh, contact slider. So nothing special there. But, uh, yeah, we've got our passives. And, well, let me try and flip this metalwork on the top off. And ta-da, here we go. I can see some extra metal under there where all those screws plugged in. And, aha, ta-da, look at that. I was... Uh, 100% right there. That was they clearly got these um, aluminium blocks on there. There we go. There's our got our compound on the bottom there. They just yeah they they're not the glue type. They've just oh, stuck those down. Ah, oh, get off. There we go. Not a problem. And they've done that. Oh, and their memory as well. They've heat sunk the memory. There we go. Must be screaming along at a rate of uh, megahertz, and uh, that's it. That's pretty much what I expected. The two-chip solution, we'll have a look at with the macro lens, but we're going to have the uh, CPU and the uh, graphics uh, chip. I'm not sure which one's what yet. We've got our memory, memory expansion socket right here. You know, they're trying to, you know, uh, well, you can argue what their uh, uh, thing here, you know, optional extra, they're trying to sell it. They could have put that memory on the main board but of course it keeps the price point down and gives you an extra uh, retail sale as well some sort of upsell with these things of course with the uh, memory slot but that looks like it's just tied in there there's nothing special doesn't look to be any uh, protection in that at all actually no there's bypassing on the back but there's no like uh, you know um, there's no protection in on the inputs there at all it just looks like it hooks straight onto the memory bus there but yeah they were transferring the heat directly out of these devices um, straight onto that heatsink there and a few miscellaneous stuff around here we'll take a look at but that is pretty much it and that's what you'd expect in a you know when you manufacture things in the millions something like this you want to get down to a couple of chip solution absolute bare bone stuff and of course the other thing which is notable uh, in its absence from this entire design is any wiring whatsoever. This thing rolls off the uh, assembly line, of course, uh, the uh, 
um, well, they look like they're wave, yeah, they look like they're wave soldered, everything's uh, wave soldered, so that's fully machine assembled, even the uh, main connector over here, possibly, um, I, I don't know, but yeah, basically uh, that rolls off the uh, assembly line, even if there is um, the odd thing which is uh, hand soldered, but uh, then they pretty much just bang, pop it straight into the box and that's it. Now apparently there were a lot of versions of this board actually produced for various uh, markets and uh, uh, some chips weren't fitted and uh, some were combined, various things and stuff like that. So I'm not exactly sure uh, which version I've got here, so uh, forgive me if I get it wrong, but let's take a look at some of the individual chips on here. And by the way, uh, date code on this thing, uh, 1997, uh, early weeks, 97s. And first up, we've got ourselves an AMP NUS, A-M-P-N-U-S. N-U-S uh, stands for Nintendo Ultimate 64. So you'll see that branded on every single one of these chips. Now, presumably that's an audio amp. You can see the large uh, caps around that, coupling that. Now, of course, um, this... Uh, whether or not it's a fully uh, custom chip for Nintendo or whether or not it's an, uh, just a uh, re-labeled uh, off-the-shelf one, I don't know. But every single chip in this, almost every chip, is uh, re-labeled uh, with NUS. And moving up here, we have a non-NUS uh, branded chip and it's a 9480F. It's actually a BU9480F and that's a 16-bit stereo audio DAC. So uh, that one, um, of course, is just uh, driving the main amp here and that's where you get your stereo audio from and i haven't researched into what these two jumpers are here they look like a uh, surface mount um, cap but they're actually labeled uh, jp4 and jp5 and as you can see the pins are shorted together like that and if we spin the board around here near the 9480f we have a d ink nus which is actually a video dac uh, combined video DAC and video encoder, hence DAC encoder, I guess that uh, stands for there. And I believe this one was only fitted to the PAL only modules. Either uh, uh, something else was fitted for the NTSC or they didn't uh, have it at all. Presumably uh, they fitted another type in there. And we have ourselves our main clocks here. These are MX8330. By the way, um, any data sheets for these will be linked into the uh, notes down below and uh, they take uh, your basic uh, 3 4 megahertz uh, crystal oscillator and depending on uh, the pin strapping configuration can either multiply that by 4 times 14 or 7 17 times 4 so to give you an output in the order of uh, 200 megahertz it's a uh, ram bus clock generator and the ram here is uh, comes standard with 4 megabytes an additional uh, 4 megabytes in the ram expansion pack and these are actually uh, ram bus chips so once again uh, you know custom branded with the uh, nintendo name and uh, part number there working up to what uh, 500 megahertz with a peak bandwidth according to wikipedia of 562.5 megabytes per second pretty darn quick and here's the main processor it's the cpu nus a and this one's actually 64-bit nec vr4300 which is a derivative of the uh, mips technology r4300 100i and yes it was actually manufactured by nec for nintendo and this one was actually clocked at uh, 93.75 megahertz and uh, this made it one of the most powerful uh, consoles of its day of course but uh, yeah if it had like a six year uh, time frame by the time it got to the end of it eh not so crash hot and also limited in terms of uh, gameplay with the uh, cartridge based uh, system basically you simply could not fit as much uh, data as you could on a uh, DVD based systems which are also out at the time and although this is a 64-bit um, processor I believe they actually used it mostly in 32-bit uh, mode which made for a more uh, compact memory uh, structure and stuff like that so they could fit more into your lousy four megabytes of memory or your eight um, with the uh, expansion uh, cartridge so and uh, so most of the time they weren't utilizing the full 64-bit potential of this CPU and here's the graphics processor, the RCP or Reality uh, Coprocessor module, actually uh, designed by um, SGI in uh, conjunction with Nintendo. And it runs at 62.5 megahertz, and uh, it's got two modules inside. One is the uh, Reality Drawing Processor, great name, the RDP, and the Reality Signal Processor or RSP. Woohoo! And uh, both of these uh, communicate with the 
other modules via an internal 128-bit uh, data bus at one gig of bytes per second. So pretty darn quick. No wonder they needed the uh, heatsink block on there and uh, spreading that heat out because this thing probably got a bit warm. Now the RSP inside here or the reality uh, signal processor is actually um, in reality a MIPS um, R4000 based uh, integer vector processor and that did uh, various stuff in terms of uh, lighting and uh, transforms and things like that and then the RDP the reality display processor is the uh, rasterizer and that handles all the um, uh, Z buffer computation and all that stuff if you're into your gaming graphics architecture and that RSP part of it can also do the audio as well but apparently the main CPU can do audio so depending on how you program this sucker how you program your individual game you can get the uh, graphics coprocessor to do the audio or you can task that to the main processor and of course the graphics on this thing are 16.8 million colors so no slouch there only a lousy 640 by 480 pixels but uh, I guess that was you know not bad in its day but of course eh, very old school these days and then we've got our PIF NUS which is the peripheral interface uh, chip and that handles um, all of the peripheral stuff as the name says the uh, controllers and that sort of stuff but it also contains um, uh, some sort of uh, security in there as well so you can't uh, play back uh, games from a different region so I don't know about uh, hacks on the Nintendo uh, 64 but if you're gonna hack it that's probably where a lot of the actions gonna happen and that looks like a Texas Instruments part. I'm not entirely sure uh, what that sucker is, but uh, it's obviously tied into the peripheral interface chip somehow. And there we go. We do have a 5 volt rail in this thing, uh, powered from a, a bog standard uh, 7805 regulator using the uh, PCB as a heatsink there, direct from the uh, 12 volt input. So that couldn't be uh, uh, drawing, you know, a huge amount of. Um, power there obviously with that uh, sort of heat sink and the uh, 7 volt drop on that thing it's not like it's going to be uh, driving an amp or something like that. Now you might think this main socket here would be soldered in but you'd be wrong. Ta-da! Look at that! It's actually uh, just socketed it just pulls out like that. They've got lots of uh, RFI contacts along there which go down to the main pads on the main board but the bottom connector down in there is the one that's actually um, soldered the expansion connector on the back look at that and look at all the uh, ugly flux residue on that thing Blah, they've hand soldered that one so yeah they must be really confident with the uh, wiping action inside that uh, socket I mean this is the main cartridge one and it's gonna get you know an absolute pounding from uh, these kids just sleaz gamer Kitty's just slamming these cartridges in and out like crazy. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's really actually uh, quite surprising. Although, um, once again, if you did that, maybe they've done that deliberately because if you use uh, solder joints, you're going to actually apply uh, stress to them. You've got to make sure your connectors design well to sort of uh, take the stress off the uh, pins. But in this case, it probably, you know, it might actually be rather clever in that, uh, you know, they slam down the cartridge and... Uh, you're not in fear of actually uh, breaking anything, you know, cracking a uh, solder joint due to, uh, you know, uh, stress and shock. So, yeah, that could be a rather clever design. And, of course, there's nothing in way of uh, protection for that uh, expansion bus at all. Just, you know, it flows straight into the main uh, chip there. Nothing doing. Someone was a fan of their nice curved traces there. Look at that. Oh, they've mixed and matched. Look at that. That one's got a... Uh, that one's got a 45 angle on it, the rest are nice and smooth. So the electrons just race nice and smoothly around the bend there. Actually, there wouldn't be any uh, Doppler shift noise because they'd be moving so slow at that uh, drift velocity rate. Whoa, crawling along. And as we said at the start, really nothing doing on the bottom here. Like, there's the main uh, graphic chip there and they've got a you know, huge amount of eyes in there real low inductive uh, uh, high current uh, path for the main chip in there probably working at uh, that'd be direct from the 3.3 oh here it is even look little arrows 3.3 volts there it is whizzes down here oh, into your main CPU chip with all its bypassing there lots of vias 
Lots of via stitching in there and going around here. Oh, off the expansion connector as well. 3.3 volts on there. It's all three, so it'll be 3.3 uh, volt I.O. on there. And uh, down to your main graphic chip down here. Oh, look at all the via action in there. And put one in the middle because it looks sexy. So there you have it. That's uh, pretty much the main board in a nutshell. Uh, very nicely design, very minimalist design and huge attention to detail are uh, paid in terms of the shielding and, uh, you know, uh, EMI stuff. I mean, you know, they've really gone to town there. Absolutely phenomenal. And, of course, all single board uh, construction. I mean, you know, the only uh, sort of dodgy thing is, you know, your hand assembled connector up here. But apart from that, you know, really clever systems engineering to go into that. But of course they would have spent a lot of engineer hours on this, uh, let me tell you, trying to uh, perfect it and all the variations of it for the different markets as well. By the way, I forgot to take note of the rather uh, unusual package on the RAM bus memory up here. Look, there's only four pins on the toppy here and uh, there, so all the I.O. is along the bottom down here. There you go, you don't see much of that. Well... I don't, th I can't recall seeing that anywhere today. I could be wrong, but geez, yeah, it's not common. And I've powered this thing up, and it's uh, much lower than its uh, specified max or, you know, average. I don't know what it is marked on the uh, back there, uh, presumably because uh, there's no cartridge plugged in, and, of course, we're not running a game. But, hey, both the 12-volt uh, and 3.3-volt rails are pulling something. We'll just do some basic probing around here. Yes, I've got my uh, low impedance attachment on there for the ground. So let's probe this crystal down here. It says 14.7 megahertz, so we should be able to... don't even need to read the pin out, so I can guess. There we go, 14.7, bang. And the other one up here, so that one says 17.7. Hang on, let's get another ground point. And there we go, 17.734. Megahertz, so those two uh, crystals are working, not a problem at all. Let's look at our 5 volt rail up here. I mean, this sucker's not supposed to be working, but yeah, there it is. Bang, 5 volts, we're at uh, 1 volt per division there. So, we're all working. So the uh, main clocks are going, so let's have a look at the output of those. And that lower chip from the 14.7 megahertz, we are getting bang on 50 megahertz output on that sucker. And the top one up there, driven from the 17.7 .7 megahertz crystal, it's a uh, clock going off to the uh, uh, D -enco the um, encoder uh, chip plus the main graphic processor. That one is uh, 49.657. Now I can't see any memory bus action on the first chip. I'm not sure if there's separate uh, memory interfaces or not, but uh, we get in really no activity there at all, nothing doing. Um, so either, you know, presumably the thing just uh, shuts down and does nothing when there's no cartridge um, installed, or this thing is, um, yeah, grossly uh, faulty, and uh, we're getting nothing. So I'm not sure what uh, normal system operation is supposed to be there, but, uh, it, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if the chip just shuts down and does absolutely nothing, like the graphics chip does nothing until... Um, well, the main CPU would be running, so it'd be um, sharing some of that, presumably. And well, I, you know, eh, I don't know, but it wouldn't surprise me if it just, you know, went into some uh, sort of hibernation mode, just waiting to uh, uh, plug a cartridge into there. And the termination voltage, which has its own uh, low dropout regulator down in here, that's uh, measuring, yeah, two and a half volts. And I'm not seeing anything between the two, uh, the CPU and the uh, graphics processor either, so really, yeah, either this thing's uh, dead as a dodo or it's in uh, some sort of uh, weight slash uh, hibernation mode for that cartridge. But hold on to your hat, folks, we are getting some data on this uh, video bus here, which goes over to the uh, D encoder. Looks like the same stuff on all the pins, so... Yeah, interesting, but uh, there is uh, certainly something happening there in terms of the video. I mean, that's uh, that's just the same thing going on at, uh, you know, 12.4 megahertz. There's uh, quite a few pins there have exactly the same signal on it. So I'm sorry to tell you that's uh, 
as boring as the proverbial bat poo. I don't uh, see anything uh, exciting there at all. I was hoping to, you know, maybe get out my active probe and measure, you know, a couple of hundred megahertz or uh, something like that, but nah, nothing doing there at all. So I'm not sure what the deal is there. I was told it was faulty, so yeah, who knows. Um, so thanks very much, Dave, for sending that in to mailbag slash teardown Tuesday. And if you like the segment, as always, please give it a big thumbs up. And the place to discuss it is the EEV blog forum, where probably 150 or 200 people are hanging out right now, just oh, expressing their opinion, answering, helping questions. It's a fantastic place to be, the forum. Anyway, that is a very interesting look inside a... Uh, 1996 slash, well this one, 97 vintage Nintendo N64. I hope that brought a tear to the eye of uh, some people who have fond memories of that. Catch you next time.